the Clary Hugh. Elizabeth Barrett was kept in a garret. Her father resented it bitterly when Robert Browning took her to Italy. Oscar Wilde had his reputation defiled. As he was led from the dock in tears, he said, We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at two years. D. H. Lawrence held flies in abhorrence. He once wrote a verse graffito deploring the humble mosquito. Ted Hughes had a very short fuse. What prompted his wrath was being asked about Sylvia Plath. The Clerihue is named after Edmund Clerihue Bentley, father of Nicholas, that peerless illustrator who always signed his work, Nicholas Bentley drew the pictures. The rules state that Clerihues be non-metrically written in two couplets, the first of which is to be a proper name and nothing else. The best known originals include Christopher Wren said I'm going to dine with some men. If anyone calls, say I'm designing St Paul's. Sir Humphrey Davy abominated gravy. He lived in the odium of having discovered sodium. John Stuart Mill, by a mighty effort of will, overcame his natural bonhomie and wrote Principles of Economy. Metrical clumsiness is very much a desideratum. Indeed, it is considered extremely bad form for a clerihue to scan. Properly done, they should tell some biographical truth, obvious or otherwise, about their subject, rather than be sheer nonsense. Sir Humphrey's dislike of gravy, for example, may well be whimsical tosh, but he did discover sodium. I've tried to cleave to this requirement in my Clary Hughes on the poets. Clary Hughes have, therefore, some utility as biographical mnemonics. The Limerick There was a middle-aged writer called Fry whose book on verse was a lie. For the ode less travelled soon unravelled to reveal some serious errors in its scansion and wry. Unlike Clary Hughes, limericks, as we discovered when considering their true metrical nature, we decided they were anapistic, if you recall, do and must scan. I'm sure you need to be told little else about them. The name is said to come from a boozy tavern chorus, Will You Come Up to Limerick? Although they are popularly associated with Edward Lear, anonymous verses in the There Was an Old Woman Of formulation predated him by many years. A merry old man of a porto had long had the gout in his forto, and oft when he spoke to relate a good joke, a terrible twinge cut it shorto. Said a very proud farmer at Reigate, when the squire rode up to his highgate, with your horse and your hound, you'd better go round, for I say you shan't jump over my gate. That pair was accompanied by Crookshank illustrations in a children's chap book of around 1820, when Lear was just eight or nine years old. Oddly, these examples accord more closely to the modern sense of what a limerick should be than Lear's own effusions, in which the last line often lamely repeats the first. There was an old man of the West who wore a pale plum-coloured vest, when they said, does it fit, he replied, not a bit, that uneasy old man of the West. Rather flat to the modern ear, I find. We prefer a punchline. Girls who frequent picture palaces set no store by psychoanalysis, and although Sigmund Freud would be greatly annoyed, they cling to their long-standing fallacies, or fallacies, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. It was W.S. Baring Gold's collection, The Lure of the Limerick, that really understood the base, in both senses, nature of the form. I remember owning a Panther Books edition, an imprint known for publishing risque but classy works, Jeunet and the like, and finding their scabrous and cloacal nature hilarious, as any unhealthy ten-year-old would. This anonymous, so far as I can tell, limerick puts it well. The limerick packs laughs anatomical into space that is quite economical, but the good ones I've seen so seldom are clean, and the clean ones so seldom are comical. When I began collecting the works of Norman Douglas, I was delighted to find a copy of his 1928 anthology, Some Limericks, which remains deeply shocking to this day. Most of them are simply disgusting. Hard to believe that an antiquarian belle triste like Douglas, you may remember his wagtail anacreontics, would dare risk attaching his name to them at a time when Ulysses was being impounded by customs officers on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Please do not listen to these three examples of Douglas's literary excavations. Skip to the next track instead. There was an old fellow of Brest who sucked off his wife with a zest. Despite her great yowls, he sucked out her bowels and spat them over her chest. There was a young man of Nantucket whose prick was so long he could suck it. He said with a grin as he wiped off his chin, if my ear were a cunt, I could fuck it. There was an old man of Brienz, the length of whose cock was immense. With one swerve he could plug, a boy's bottom in zug, and a kitchen maid's cunt in Koblenz. Reflections on comic and impolite verse. Comic forms, such as the limerick and the clerihue, are the pocket cartoons of poetry. Often they fail dismally to provoke the slightest smile, although those collected by Norman Douglas can certainly provoke cries of outrage and simulated or stimulated disgust. It seems to me that the city of poesy, with its associations of delicacy, refined emotion, and exquisite literacy, is all the richer for having these moral slums within its walls. No metropolis worth visiting is without its red-light district, its cruising areas, and a bohemian village where absinthe flows, reefers glow, and love is free. W. H. Auden wrote obscene comic verse, which you will not find anthologized by Faber and Faber. See if you can get hold of A Platonic Blow, for example. And even the retiring Robert Frost had the occasional reluctant and unconvincing stab at being saucy. Obscenity is a fit manner for comic verse. Without it, the twin horrors of whimsy and cuteness threaten. There is surely no word in the language that causes the heart to sink like a stone so much as humorous. Wit is one thing, bawdy another, but humorousness. Humorousness is to wit what a suburban lawn is to either Sissinghurst or a rubbish heap what an executive saloon is to an Aston Martin or a cheerful old banger. Wit is either a steel rapier or a lead cosh, rarely a cutely fashioned paper dart. Wit is not nice. Wit is not affirmative or consoling. Jonathan Swift, describing how a beautiful young nymph goes to bed, is unafraid of being disgusting in his disgust. Corinna, pride of Drury Lane, returning at the midnight hour, four stories climbing to her bower, then, seated on a three-legged chair, takes off her artificial hair. Now, picking out a crystal eye, she wipes it clean and lays it by. Her eyebrows from a mouse's hide, stuck on with art on either side, pulls off with care, and first displays them, then, in a playbook, smoothly lays them. Now dexterously her plumpers draws that serve to fill her hollow jaws, untwists a wire, and from her gums a set of teeth completely comes, pulls out the rags contrived to prop her flabby dugs, and down they drop. Proceeding on, the lovely goddess unlaces next her steel-ribbed bodice, which by the operator's skill press down the lumps, the hollows fill. Up hose her hand, and off she slips the bolsters that supply her hips. With gentlest touch she next explores her shankers, issues, running sores, effects of many a sad disaster, and then to each applies a plaster. But must, before she goes to bed, rub off the daubs of white and red, and smooth the furrows in her front, with greasy paper stuck a punt. She takes a bolus ere she sleeps, and then, between two blankets, creeps. Corinna wakes, a dreadful sight. Behold the ruins of the night. A wicked rat her plaster stole, half eat and dragged it to his hole. The crystal eye, alas, was missed, and Puss had on her plumpers pissed. A pigeon picked her issue peas, and shock her tresses filled with fleas. The nymph though in this mangled plight must every morn her limbs unite. But how shall I describe her arts, to recollect the scattered parts, or show the anguish, toil, and pain of gathering up herself again? The bashful muse will never bear in such a scene to interfere. 
Corinna in the morning dizened, who sees will spew, who smells be poisoned. Heroic verse indeed. Even more scabrous, scatological, and downright disgraceful was the 17th century's one man Derrick and Clive, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester. I'm afraid this is very rude, so do skip forward to the next section if you'd rather not hear it. She was so exquisite a whore that in the belly of her mother she turned her cunt so right before her father fucked them both together. Hmm. Nice. Light verse. It is revealing that in polls to find the most popular poets, names like Shel Silverstein, Wendy Cope, Spike Milligan, Roald Dahl, Roger McGuff, Benjamin Zephaniah, John Betjeman, Glyn Maxwell, and Langston Hughes consistently appear high in the charts. Not that all their work is comic, of course. Certainly Emily Dickinson, Dylan Thomas, Philip Larkin, Sylvia Plath, and Pablo Neruda feature too. Not that all their work is serious, of course. There seems to be, though, an inexhaustible appetite for verse whose major rhetorical instrument is wit or lightness of touch. It is notable also that long poems seem a great deal less appealing to the public. Perhaps this is something to do with our culture of immediacy. Fast food verse for fast food people. Whatever the reason, it seems to me self-evident that if you wish your poetry to make a noise outside the world of academia, poetry magazines and private gesellschaften, your chances are greatly increased by their possession of an element of esprit. Perhaps the description that best fits the work of the more popular poets is not comic, but light. Angels can fly because they take themselves lightly, said Chesterton. Light verse does not need to be comic in intent or witty in nature. It encourages readers to believe that they and the poet share the same discourse, intelligence and standing, inhabit the same universe of feeling and cultural reference. It does not howl in misunderstood loneliness, wallow in romantic agony, or bombard the reader with learning and illusion from a Parnassian or obstrusely academic height. This kind of poetry, Auden argues in his introduction to the Oxford Book of Light Verse, was mainstream until the arrival of the Romantics. With the exception of sacred verse, Miltonic epics, drama, and the more complex metaphysical poems of the 17th century, almost all poetry was more or less light. It was adult, it could be moving, angry, erotic, and even religious, but it was digestible. It was not embarrassed by the idea of likability and accessibility. A poem could be admired because it was prettily made and charming to read. Mozartian qualities, if you like. Modernism appeared to drive lightness out of poetry forever. These popularity polls, irksome as they may be, seem to indicate that it is far from dead, however. In the knowledge that gravity will destroy us in the end, perhaps levity is not so trivial a response. Parody. Neither are parody and pastiche an unfit manner for the poet. Chaucer began the trend in English with a scintillating parody of a badly versified epical romance called Sir Topaz. Shakespeare parodied Marlowe, as did Dunn, in praise of angling in the style of the passionate shepherd. Byron parodied and was parodied. Dryden, Johnson and Swift parodied and were parodied, and so it went on. Trends in the actual nuts and bolts of versification were ruthlessly guyed by Pope in the Dunciad, George Canning and John Hookham Frere, the former of Castlereagh, the latter of Whistlecraft fame, and the pair of them high Tory anti-Jacobins, made great sport of the Democrat Southey's experiments in dactylics. Wearisome sonneteer, feeble and querulous, painfully dragging out thy democratic lays, moon-stricken sonneteer, ah, for thy heavenly chance, sorely thy dactylics lag on uneven feet, Slow is the syllable which thou wouldst urge to speed, lame and o'erburdened, and screaming its wretchedness. They had a go at his sapphic verse, too. Needy knife-grinder, whither are you going? Rough is the road, your wheel is out of order. Bleak blows the blast, your hat has got a hole in't. So have your breeches. 
Byron was always savage at the expense of the liquors. It is fair to observe that he, silver spoon nobleman as he was, remained a true radical all his life, while both Southey and Wordsworth accepted the king's shilling and butt of Malmsey as poet's laureate, ending their lives as comfortable establishment grandees. Byron seemed to detect an air of fraudulence early on. Here is his parody of Wordsworth's Peter Bell. There's something in a stupid ass and something in a heavy dunce. But never since I went to school I saw or heard so damned a fool as William Wordsworth is for once. They say the modern literary world is full of squabbling hatred and simmering resentments, but it is as nothing to the past. The individuality and restless stressed energy of Hopkins makes him ripe for pastiche. Anthony Brood was inspired to write a perfect Hopkins parody after reading this on his cereal packet one morning. Delicious heart of the corn fresh from the oven flakes are sparkled and spangled with sugar for a can't-be-resisted flavour. Parenthesis proud, bracket bold, happiest with hyphens, the writers stagger intoxicated by terms, adjective unsteadied, describing in graceless phrases fizzling like soda siphons, all things crisp, crunchy, malted, tangy, sugared and shredded. Parodies are rife in popular culture, a staple of television comedy, but literary and verse parodies seem to have fallen from fashion, Wendy Cope being one of the few practising poets who plays happily and fruitfully with the style of other poets. Now it's your turn. Poetry Exercise 15 I'm sure you have a favourite poet. Write a parody of their style and prosodic manner. Try to make it comically inappropriate. If you like Ted Hughes, try writing a fearsome, physically tough description of a Barbie doll or something else very un -Hughesy. I know this is a bit of a spectator competition sort of exercise, but it is a good way of noticing all the metrical, rhyming and formal mannerisms of a poet. If you're really feeling bold, try writing a cento. You will need the collected works of the poet you choose, otherwise a cento mixing different verses from an anthology might be worth trying. Surprise yourself. Exotic forms. I mean exotic here in its original sense of from far away, not in the travel brochure sense. Haiku, Senryu, Tanka, Kazel, Lukbat, Tanaga. Haiku. Five, seven, and five. Seventeen essential oils for warm winter nights. The haiku, as you may already know, is a three-line poem of Japanese origin whose lines are composed of five, seven, and five syllables. There is much debate as to whether there is any purpose to be served in English language versions of the form. Those who understand Japanese are strong in their insistence that haikus in our tongue are less than a pale shadow of the homegrown original. English, as a stress-timed language, cannot hope to reproduce the effects of syllable-timed Japanese. I defined these terms, rather vaguely, you may remember, in the section on syllabic verse in Chapter 1. Just so that you are aware, there is a great deal more to the haiku than mere syllable count. For one thing, it is considered de rigueur to include the season of the year, if not as crassly as mine does, then at least by some other reference to weather or atmosphere, what is known as a kigo word. A reverence for life and the natural world is another apparent sine qua non of the form, the aim being to provide a kind of oral, imagistic snapshot, a chassé or sketch of nature. The senses should be engaged, and verbs kept to a minimum, if not expunged entirely, the general tenor and thrust of the form, believe me, I'm no expert, seems to be for the poet, Haijin, to await a haiku moment, an epiphany or imaginative inspiration of some kind. The haiku is a distillation of such a moment. In their native land, haikus are written in one line, which renders the idea of a 575 syllable count all the more questionable. They also contain many puns, kake kotaba, this not being considered a groan-worthy practice in Japanese. 
a caesura or kiregi should be felt at the end of either the first or second line. Haiku descends from Haikai no Renga, a playful linked verse development of a shorter form called waka. The Haikai's first stanza was called a hoku, and when poets like Masaoka Shiki developed their new standalone form in the 19th century, they yoked together the words Haikai and hoku to make haiku. We now tend to backdate the term and call the short poems of 17th century masters such as Matsuo Basho haikus, although they ought really to be called hokus. Clear? A haiku which does not include a kigo word and is more about human than physical nature is called a senryu, which confusingly means river willow. Those who have studied the form properly and write them in English are now very unlikely to stick to the 575 framework. The Japanese sound unit, un, is very different from our syllable, and most original examples contain far fewer words than their English equivalents. For some, the whole enterprise is a doomed and fatuous mismatch, as misguided as eating the Sunday roast with chopsticks and calling it sushi. Nonetheless, non-Japanese speakers of some renown have tried them. They seem to have been especially appealing to the American beat poets, Ginsberg, Ferlinghetti, Corso and Kerouac, as well as to Spanish language poets like Octavio Paz and Jorge Luis Borges. Here are a couple of Borges examples. It's possible that haikus in Spanish, which like Japanese is syllabically timed, work better than in English. My literal translations do not obey the syllabic imperatives. La vasta noche no es ahora otra cosa que una fragrancia. The enormous night is now nothing more than a fragrance. Callan las cuerdas, la música sabía lo que yo siento. The strings are silent, the music knew what I was feeling. Borges also experimented with another waka descended Japanese form, the tanka, also known as Yamato Uta. I shall refrain from entering into the nuances of the form, which appear to be complex and unsettled, certainly as far as their use in English goes. The general view appears to be that they are five line poems with a syllable count of five, seven, five, seven, seven. In Spanish, in the hands of Borges, they sound like this. La ajena copa La espada que fue espada, en otro mano, la luna de la calle, dime, acaso no bastan? Another's cup, the sword which was a sword in another's hand, the moon in the street, say to me, perhaps they are not enough. The form has recently grown in popularity thanks, in large part, to the publication American Tanker and a proliferation of tanker sites on the internet. Kazel. The lines in Kazel always need to run in pairs. They come like mother-daughter, father-son in pairs. I'll change the subject, as this ancient form requires. It offers hours of simple, harmless fun in pairs. Apparently a Persian form from far-off days, it needs composing just as I have done in pairs. And when I think the poem's finished and complete, I, Stephen Fry, Pronounce my work is unimpaired. My version is a rather bastardly abortion, I fear, but the key principles are mostly adhered to. The lines of a guzzle, spelt G-H-A-Z-A-L, come in metrical couplets. The rhymes are unusual in that the last phrase of the opening two lines, and second lines of each subsequent couplet, is a refrain, radif. It is the word before the refrain that is rhymed. I have cheated with the last rhyme-refrain pairing, as you probably noticed. Each couplet should be a discrete, but not necessarily discreet, if you know what I mean, entity unto itself. No enjambment being permitted or overall theme being necessary. It is usual, but not obligatory, for the poet to sign his name, as it were, in the last line, as I have done. The growth in the form's popularity in English is largely due to its rediscovery by a generation of Pakistani and Indian poets keen to reclaim an ancient form with which they feel a natural kinship. As with the haiku, 
It may seem to some impertinent and inappropriate to try and wrench the form out of its natural context, like taking a Lancashire hot pot out of a tandoori oven and serving it as Asian food. I see nothing intrinsically wrong with such attempts at cultural crossbreeding myself, but I am no authority. Luke Butt. Luke Butt is rather cute. It keeps the mind astute and pert. It doesn't really hurt to keep the mind alertly keen. You'll know just what I mean when you have gone and been and done your own completed one. It's really rather fun to do, full of subtlety too. I hope that yours earn you repute. This is a Vietnamese form much easier to do than to describe. Luke Butt is based on a syllable count that alternates six eight six eight six eight and so on until the poet comes to his final pair of six eight lines the overall length is not fixed the sixth syllables rhyme in couplets like my cute astute but the eight syllable lines have a second rhyme pert in my example which rhymes with the sixth syllable of the next line hurt when you come to the final eight syllable line its eighth syllable rhymes with the first line of the poem repute back to cute I don't expect you to understand it from that garbled explanation. Luke Bat is the Vietnamese for 6-8. The form is commonly found as a medium for two-line riddles, rhyming as above. Completely round and white. After baths, they're tight together. Milk inside, not a yak. Hairy too, this snack is fleshy. Plates and coconuts, in case you haven't cracked them. Proper poems in Vietnamese use a stress system divided into the two pleasingly named elements bang and track, which I cannot begin to explain since I cannot begin to understand them. Once more, the internet seems to have been responsible for raising this form obscure outside its country of origin to something like cult status. It has variations. Song Tat Luk Bat, which literally means 2768, consists of a seven-syllable rhyming couplet followed by sixes and eights that rhyme according to another scheme that I won't bother you with. I'm sure you can search Vietnamese literature or Van Chuang Bac Hoc resources if you wish to know more. Tanaga. The Tanaga owes its genes to forms from the Philippines. To count all your words like beans, you may need adding machines. The Tanaga is a short, non-metric Filipino form consisting of four seven-syllable lines rhyming A-A-A-A, although modern English language Tanagas allow A-B-A-B, A-A-B-B, and A-B-B-A. I am not aware of any masterpieces having yet been composed in our language, but there it is for your pleasure. Poetry Exercise 16. Four haikus in the usual mongrel English form, one for each season, so do not forget your Kigo word. The Sonnet. I wrote a bad Petrarchan sonnet once in two laborious weeks, a throttled stream of words, sure following the proper scheme of Abba, Abba. Oh, but what a dunce I was to think those yells and tortured grunts could help me find an apt poetic theme. The more we try to think, the more we dream, the more we whet our wit, the more it blunts. But give that dreaming part of you release. Allow your thrashing conscious brain a break. Let howling Tom become a purring kitten, and civil war dissolves to inward peace. A thousand possibilities awake, and suddenly your precious sonnets written. The sonnets' fourteen lines have called to poets for almost a thousand years. It is the Goldilocks form. When others seem too long, too short, too intricate, too shapeless, too heavy, too light, too simple, or too demanding, the sonnet is always just right. It has the compactness to contain a single thought and feeling, but space enough for narrative, development, and change. The sonnet was, they say, invented in the 13th century by Giacomo d'Alentini in the Sicilian court of the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. Dante and D'Arezzo and others experimented with it, but it was Francesco Petrarca, Petrarch, who shaped it into the form 
which was to have so tremendous an impact on European and English poetry. In the papal court of Avignon, he composed his cycle of sonnets to Laura, a girl he always claimed was flesh and blood, but whom many believed to be a conjured ideal. His sonnets made their way over to God-fearing medieval England and lay there like gleaming alien technology, dazzling in their sophistication, knowledge, mastery and promise, frightening in their freedom, daring and originality. Chaucer knew of them and admired them, but their humanism, their promotion of personal feeling and open inquiry, the vigour and self-assertion of their individual voice would have made any attempt on his part to write such works, if indeed he had that desire, a kind of heresy or treason. We had to wait 200 years for the warm winds of the Renaissance truly to cross the channel and thaw us out of our monkish and feudal inertia. In the 120 or so years between the Reformation and the Restoration, the sonnet had, like some exotic plant, been grafted, grown, hot-housed and hybridized into a flourishing new native stock, cross-bred to suit the particular winds and weather of our emotional and intellectual climate. This breeding began under Wyatt and Surrey, great pioneers in many areas of English verse, and was carried on by Sidney, Shakespeare, Drummond, Drayton, Dunn, Herbert and Milton. The next century saw an equally rapid decline. It is hard to think of a single sonnet being written between the death of Milton in the 1670s and the publication of Wordsworth's first sonnets 130 years later. Just as Wren and the Great Fire between them redesigned half-timbered higgledy-piggledy Tudor London into a metropolis of elegant neoclassical squares and streets, so Dryden, Johnson and Pope preferred to address the world from a Palladian balcony, the dignified harmonious grandeur of the heroic couplet, replacing what they saw as the vulgar egoism of the lowly sonnet and its unedifying emotional wrestling matches. Those very personal qualities of the sonnet were precisely what attracted Wordsworth and the Romantic poets, of course, and from their day to ours it has remained a popular verse forum for a poet's debate with himself. The structure of the Petrarchan sonnet, preferred and adapted by Dunn, Milton and many others, is easily expressed. The first eight lines, Abba, Abba, are called the octave. The second six lines, C-D-E, C-D-E, or C-D-D, C-C-D, or C-D-C, C-D-C, the sestet. The ninth line, the beginning of the sestet, marks what is called the volta, the turn. This is the moment when a contrary point of view, a doubt or a denial, is often expressed. It is the sonnet's pivot or fulcrum. In mine, at the top of this section, the ninth line begins with a but, a rather obvious way of marking that moment, although you may recall Dunn uses the same word in his At the Round World's Imagined Corners, cited in Chapter 2. In Wordsworth's The World is Too Much With Us, which you'll hear shortly, the volta comes in the middle of the ninth line. It is precisely here, after It Moves Us Not, that, overlooking the sea, having pondered the rush of the modern Christian world in its commerce and crassness and its blindness to nature, Wordsworth, as it were, draws breath and makes his point. He would rather be a pagan, for whom at least nature had life and energy and meaning. A volta can be called a crisis in its literal Greek sense of turning point, as well as sometimes bearing all the connotations we now place upon the word. The world is too much with us, Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of ch Mine, at the top of this section, the ninth line begins with a but. A rather obvious way of marking that moment, although you may recall Dunn uses the same word in his At the Round World's Imagined Corners, cited in Chapter 2. In Wordsworth's The World is Too Much With Us, which you'll hear shortly, the volta comes in the middle of the ninth line. It is precisely here, after It Moves Us Not, that, 
overlooking the sea, having pondered the rush of the modern Christian world in its commerce and crassness and its blindness to nature, Wordsworth, as it were, draws breath and makes his point. He would rather be a pagan for whom at least nature had life and energy and meaning. A volta can be called a crisis in its literal Greek sense of turning point, as well as sometimes bearing all the connotations we now place upon the word. The world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon, the sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, so might I, standing on this pleasant lea, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Within the Petrarchan form's basic octave sestet structure, there are other subdivisions possible, two groups of four and two of three are natural, two quatrains and two tercets, if you prefer. Here now is Shakespeare's twenty-ninth sonnet. When, in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, haply I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. This contains one of the strongest volters imaginable. It arrives in the breath between haply and I think of thee in line 10, pivoting from the very first word of the sonnet, when. The whole first part of the poem is a vast conditional clause awaiting the critical turn. But the difference in rhyme scheme and lack of octave and sestet structure will already have shown you that Volta or no Volta, this is far from a Petrarchan sonnet. For the Tudor poets, one of the disadvantages of the Petrarchan form was that Abba Abba requires two sets of four rhyming words. While this is a breeze in Italian where every other word seems to end Eno or Ella, it could be the very deuce in English. Drayton, Daniel and Sidney radically reshaped the rhyme scheme using a new structure of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. This arrangement reached unimaginable heights in the hands of Shakespeare, after whom it is named. His great sonnets stand with Beethoven's piano sonatas as supreme expressions of the individual human voice using and fighting the benign tyranny of form, employing form itself as a metaphor for fate and the external world. Sonata and sonnet share the same etymologies, it happens, little sound. Little sounds that make a great noise. The Shakespearean sonnet offers, aside from less troublesome rhyming searches, twelve lines in its main body, three quatrains or two sestets and a couplet, and other permutations thereof, twelve is a very factorable number. The cross rhyming removes the characteristic nested sequence of envelope rhyming found in the Petrarchan form, BB inside AA and the following AA inside BB, but the reward is a new freedom and the creation of a more natural debating chamber. For this is primarily what the Shakespearean sonnet suits so well, interior debate. I have mentioned before the three-part structure that seems so primal a part of human thinking, from the thesis, antithesis, synthesis of the earliest logicians, the propositions, suppositions and proofs of Euclid, and the strophe, antistrophe and epode of Greek performance and poetic ode, to our own parliaments and senate chambers, boardrooms, courtrooms and committee rooms, this structure of proposal, counter-proposal and vote 
prosecution, defence and verdict is deep within us. It is how we seem best to frame the contrary flows of thought and feeling that would otherwise freeze us into inaction or propel us into civil war or schizophrenic uncertainty. The sonnet shares with the musical sonata a rhetorical fitness for presentation, exploration and return. While the Petrarchan sonnet's two divisions, separated by a strong volta, suit a proposition and a conclusion, the nature of the Shakespearean form allows of three quatrains with a final judgmental summing up in the trademark final couplet. Do bear in mind when I talk of a dialectical structure that the sonnet is of course a poetic form, not a philosophical. I oversimplify to draw attention to the internal movement it offers. Of course, a closing couplet can often seem glib and trite. The Romantics preferred the Petrarchan sonnet's more unified scheme, finding the Shakespearean structure of seven rhyme pairs harsh and infelicitously fractured compared to the Petrarchan's three. In modern times, the sonnet has undergone a remarkable second English language renaissance. After its notable health under Elizabeth Barrett Browning, sonnets from the Portuguese, and Hopkins, the wind hover, all nature is a Heraclitean fire, Darius wrote some syllabic sonnets, I saw the daughter of the sun is very fine, and the form was rediscovered by Auden, Berryman, Cummings, Edmondson, Vincent Millet, Elizabeth Bishop, Carolan Duffy, and many others, including Seamus Heaney, whose superb sonnets in the Hall Lantern are well worth exploring. In this century, it is more popular than ever. You will find one written every minute on the profusion of websites devoted to it. 